begin by obviously thanking everyone for taking the time to come and share with us your thoughts about the development. I, I couldn't really be happier to see the room this filled with people who care so much about this village that they took the time to come and give us some of uh, your input. So understand that for the board members and for myself, it's very challenging to do this, do our job, without knowing what you think. And so the fact that you would take your time to share, it makes our job much easier, and it gives us a really good chance of uh, reaching the right decision. Um, so generally speaking, I've been down this road a couple times. I was on the board with the Five Corners gas station, and I was on the board with the Apex development. And what we're trying to do is learn from those experiences and take that knowledge and move it forward and use it for this purpose to try to get a better process in place. So tonight is just that, is part of that effort, is to early on in this process before any decisions have been made, to listen to the community and hear what you have to say. But we've done a couple other things too to try and enhance the engagement between the board and the community. One of which is, you'll note, we have two of our consultants here tonight, Con Savoy and Valerie Kretschmer. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but we are fortunate to have them assist us with this process. And this is different than what we've done in other occasions, and we thought that this was an appropriate approach to take here, because they bring to this discussion some professionalism and some objectivity. Both of them have gone through this process before, and so we think we would benefit from their knowledge. They're here to kind of help us make that decision. They're not here to make the decision for us. But we are truly fortunate to have someone with the experience and knowledge of Khan and Valerie here. And uh, I look forward to hearing some more from them. Um, so the other thing is we've established a work group. Some of you are familiar with this. Some of you have applied for that. The amount of uh, involvement that we've gotten, the interest in the work group has truly been outstanding. Trustee Payne and I are gonna co-chair that work group. And I think we've worked out. You want, go ahead, come on. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any, anything prepared, thank you, Mark. But uh, we want to get input, and we want to get it a, a kind of from a diverse set of uh, uh, folks that are interested in this and have the energy. And so I've uh, committed my time to work with the, this task force and, and move this forward, as well as working with the uh, consultants. So, All right. thank you. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. Um, so a couple things to anywhere you wish. Um, Couple things to keep in mind as we go forward. One, this is not an official village board meeting, all right? Um, it's really just a listening session. So although Trustee Payne and I are here and some of the other trustees are present, um, it's not really designed to be a question and answer session. It's purely informational. It's really for us to learn and listen. So um, also if you wish to speak, you can sign up. I think many of you have. Um, so take that opportunity to uh, sign in and we'll get you uh, a spot on the agenda. Um, you know, I'll give you a little update on the work group. Uh, again, a great response. Uh, everyone that I've seen who's applied for that is eminently qualified to be on that work group. Um, my goal in trying to form that work group is to create some balance and some diversity. So there's sort of the conventional aspects of diversity, which are sort of race, sex, national origin. We're gonna to try to make sure everyone is represented on that. But there are some unconventional concepts of diversity that are also important. One of them is geographic. Obviously, whether some people want to acknowledge it or not, we have north of Roosevelt Road, we have south of Roosevelt Road. Look, we're all part of the same village, no matter where we live, and so, all of us, you know, pay the same taxes for the most part to the village, uh, and all of us have the same common interest here tonight, which is to try to help us make a good decision on what to do with the development. Uh, I'm happy that the feedback that I've gotten so far at least has been positive in the sense that the village's acquisition of the property solved the problem that I think existed out in that area, and hopefully that's been well received by the folks who live in the vicinity uh, and now the challenge for us is to take that opportunity and really make it you know, better for us all. So one of the things we're gonna do in terms of the work group, we wanna make sure that we have people who are south of Roosevelt Road and north of Roosevelt Road 
on that work group. I want to make sure that it has diversity with respect to age. So, you know, we're going to have some people who are young families who have kids in the schools. We're going to have senior citizens who maybe are retired. Uh, and we're going to have some young residents, hopefully. Um, one of the groups that we are certainly going to have on the work group, and I, I couldn't be happier that they have agreed to do that, uh, is the school district. And Dr. Tamaru, thank you so much for uh, your willingness to spend your time to help us with this. Obviously, this is going to have a huge impact on you and your constituents. And so we want to make sure that you are not only at the table, but also can help us understand the concerns that you have. Um, and finally, you know, we're going to have some diversity of thought. So there's some people who are interested in affordable housing. They are going to be represented on the work group. There are people who feel that they, maybe that's not the best decision. They're going to be on the work group. And I'm hopeful that all of us will be able to share those experiences in a very civil, very neighborly, very community-oriented way. And if we do that, then I think we're going to get to a good decision. Um, my expectation is Trustee Payne and I are going to be going through the applications. We've contacted, I think, just about everybody. I don't know that I've talked to everybody yet, but I've at least reached out. Uh, the goal is for March 14th, we're going to make those recommendations to the Village Board and have the Village Board approve those. So uh, you should be hearing from us shortly if you've applied. And again, we thank you for that. Couple ground rules for tonight, okay? Uh, look, admittedly, this is somewhat of an emotional issue. Uh, and But we do have one common interest, and as we kind of go through this process, I want us to keep that in mind, which is to make this village the best it is for everyone who lives in it. Um, so be courteous, be nice, be kind. Um, please don't interrupt when people are making comments or interject when people are making comments. Um, please hold your applause until I get done speaking and then you can. <laughs> um, you know, if you have one person, uh, if there's a group and you can put up one person as a spokesperson for the group, please do that. Um, come up to the microphone, state your name, state your address, let us know if you're representing a group. Um, ideally, we're looking at three to five minutes for the comments. Hopefully that's enough for everyone. I think it should be. Uh, if it looks like you have a good point and you want to go on, we'll give you some more time. But again, try to be mindful of everybody else who is here who would like to comment. So if you could keep your comments short. If someone has come up and made the point that you would like to make, all you need to do is come up and let us know that you share the view of whoever it was that expressed the thought that you, um, you, you, know, you feel you agree with. Um, we're not going to have the process of ceding time to other people. You, know, you can't uh, allow someone else to take your three minutes. Um, and uh, we'd like to finish up by 9 o'clock tonight if we could. You know, if it looks like we have more comment, we'll, we'll certainly stick around for a little while. But um, we're not going to stay here all night tonight. And the reason for that is we're going to have other opportunities for you to comment. You can do that through the website. And I think, Grant, um, if, you haven't gotten, if you haven't gotten one of these, please pick one up on your way out. It has a QR code that you can use to access the website and some comments. The work group will be conducting these same kind of sort of town hall meetings at different locations at different times in the village. So this is not your last opportunity to comment. If you don't happen to get the opportunity tonight, you'll have some more later on. Um, and now I'm going to try and do what um, I should be doing, which is listening instead of talking. Um, but Manager Franz uh, is going to provide some further comments about this process. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, President Zelsenik. Uh, I just wanted to cover just a little bit of background and then touch on uh, a public engagement and then turn over to the consultants. Uh, as we said, we're uh, really here to listen. Uh, the consultants will provide a little brief background uh, on the site and the market assessment, uh, and then we'll turn it over to anyone who wants to, to make a comment. So just a little bit of background. Um, the President Senate covered a, a little bit, but the village uh, does not often purchase private property except for a particular public purpose. However, in this case, uh, redevelopment was not occurring in, on its own, so the village board decided to intervene and purchase the property. Uh, concerns about how the property was inhibiting growth in, uh, on the Roosevelt Road corridor and being kind of an eyesore for the community uh, kind of drove the decision to purchase the property. Uh, it's, we're taking some risk, but the village board believed that it was necessary to control the property and ensure private investment in the near future. So that's kind of how we got uh, got started on this process. 
Um, the open house, again, is just a way to kind of kick off this, uh, this process and determine a collective vision for this 2.2 uh, acre site. Uh, and then uh, again, we'll be um, uh, discussing the real redevelopment process as part of our report tonight uh, and explain how everyone will be able to engage and provide feedback throughout the process. So one of the things that we're um, going to be enhancing and, and kind of launching tonight is a, 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 uh, an app uh, and a, uh, uh, the consultants uh, will get in a little more detail about that. But we've received over 100 comments about this property already. We're going to be transferring that information over to, the, uh, to this new application. Uh, and try to make it as, as an engaged process as possible and continue to give feedback as we go through um, uh, the rest of the, uh, the public engagement process. So uh, that kind of covers the key components of this. Um, again, uh, we will uh, uh, get a brief presentation from, from Khan and Valerie. I'll turn it over to them and uh, we'll get started. So again, thanks for being here. A couple logistic things here. Uh, there are, there's a water and coffee and some cookies in the back. Bathrooms are open. Uh, and again, if you haven't signed up, please uh, step out here and we can uh, get you signed up to, to, to uh, speak tonight. So without further ado, uh, Khan, it's all yours. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, on uh, behalf of our consultant team, which I'll introduce in a moment, I'm Colin Savoy, principal and president of the Savoy Consulting Group. Uh, with me, I have two other consulting firms that form our team, each with specific roles as a part of this project. My role is overall project management, guiding the overall process of the planning, uh, developer recruitment, and public engagement. Uh, Valerie Kretschmer, who's principal and president of the Valerie Kretschmer Associates, uh, leads our firm in the area of market analysis and is going to assist our team and help us understand what types of uses might work from a market point of view. As planners, we're going to be looking at this and how it works with regard to the site constraints. Valerie's going to help us understand what are the types of uses that would actually work within the marketplace, and she'll provide a little brief uh, discussion of that. And then a gentleman by the name of Todd Benadalak, president of the Egret and Ox Consulting Group, is going to be working closely with me, and I have a long relationship with Todd in a previous life of another firm, uh, helping me develop <coughs> what I'm going to talk about a little bit later, um, uh, various conceptual planning ideas for what might work based on uh, Valerie's assessment, and then assisting us in the uh, engagement process, which I'm going to uh, refer to in a little bit. Work? It did work. Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to review, and you're going to have to give me a minute because unfortunately I had to use my computer to run the presentation tonight, which I didn't expect. So with my poor eyesight, I actually have to go over to the screen <coughs> and uh, read some of the notes here. Uh, but many of you who've had any uh, uh, experience or knowledge on the site over the years uh, understand that this property has been in, in disuse, become dilapidated, in fact, more than nice or has been uh, the place for transient tenants uh, for some time. Uh, the site is a little over uh, two acres in size. Uh, it, it, it included, now it's only two buildings, but it did include one time uh, three buildings, mostly hotel uses, uh, constructed in the 1950s, so you can imagine you know, just the life of these buildings uh, would suggest that something else needed to happen. The current zoning is what's called C3 commercial, which is consistent with most of the uses along uh, Roosevelt Road. We refer to those as auto-oriented retail and service businesses, generally. Uh, generally not in, including residential uses on Roosevelt. Uh, there was a stiff district established for this area, this parcel and other parcels, to facilitate the type of redevelopment that's being contemplated for this property established in 2013. And there is a draft comprehensive plan that I'll refer to in a little bit. Uh, the purchase of the property has been well advertised. Uh, there was a purchase and sale agreement approved in June of last year. Um, uh, that was finalized in July. The purchase price ultimately the, and the closing happened, was it early this, this year, was it? Yeah, early this year for approximately $2.85 million. Um, the buildings now closed are, are vacant. Uh, and originally uh, there were 19 uh, tenants uh, there were, it says now five, this is a, some older data. Now, in fact, it's vacant and is, you know, chained off and going to be um, uh, taken down uh, shortly. All right, uh, the size, again, as I've already mentioned, uh, there's some important things you need to know. And the pointer I have here, 
doesn't work, so maybe I need to walk up to the screen. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, it works, yeah. Um, I'm going to use, uh, the, 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 the site is the shaded parcels right here, with one exclusion. And you can see the, what's referred to as the care of trees site, now a vacant building used by care of trees uh, for storage or, or whatever, um, is a site I had recently just talked to the owner and we had thought that that might be a site that could be included as a part of the overall redevelopment and this owner at this time is not interested in joining us. So that's one correction to the map. What was referred to as the Karis Tree site is no longer part of that. So the important things, I think, for, for, for your education with regard to what's possible on the site is to understand it has very limited frontage on Roosevelt Road, 125 feet. It's not too dissimilar to Dunkin' Donuts Wing Stop, so right next to it. Um, Exmoor Avenue bisects the site. There's a little offshoot alley that connects to Dunkin' Donuts, which we'll probably need to uh, preserve. We understand there's a major sewer, uh, storm sewer line coming north south through Exmoor, so that's something also that's going to have an impact on, on what can be uh, achieved on the site. Um, now the Taft Road frontage, approximately 850 feet uh, plus or minus. And there is a fairly significant grade change. You can see that behind Starbucks, less so uh, at Firestone, because I think my guess is they lowered the grade at, at the Roosevelt frontage, but there is a seven to 10 foot grade change, which also makes the development of the property problematic, particularly if you think of a, a kind of a one kind of a retail use. Uh, so you, I think you get a quick idea of uh, some of the limitations the site has just based on its configuration. Uh, the zoning already mentioned, uh, some particulars that you may be aware of. Uh, the C3 district allows buildings to be between 45 and 55 feet high. That's roughly equivalent to a four or five story building. The setbacks have to be accounted for. There's front yard setbacks, probably setbacks that would be accommodated both on Taft and um, uh, uh, Roosevelt. So these are things that you know, limit, again, what can be achieved on the site. Uses, we've already mentioned primarily audio oriented. Uh, and senior housing is allowed as a special use in the C3. And of course, what's referred to as plan developments, which are special uh, districts that are allowed for a, a, a broader range of, of types of uses. This is the comprehensive plan, the draft uh, that's currently in place. It does make recommendations, uh, several recommendations establishes some design standards for what the COP plan uh, many months ago envisioned for this site, uh, not too dissimilar to what's actually already currently allowed under zoning. Uh, however, there are some things here that you need to understand. Uh, first of all, this is within your comprehensive plan, they're already doing things that we're going to be doing for you later in this process is examining what are the potential at a conceptual plan level, which means we're not developers, we're not su suggesting a, a specific uh, property uh, type, but looking at different options. But there are some things when you look at the comprehensive plan, you say, oh, well, why don't you do this? Or why isn't that an option? You need to understand there's a couple of misleading things, and, and, and they were exploring all the options, I get it, but, but it's, it's a different picture than what we have to work with. First of all, we don't have this kind of frontage uh, right now. We have a very much limited frontage. I believe that's Dunkin' Donuts. That means they assumed wing stops was going to go away right now. We have no knowledge of or any participation of that owner. Uh, somewhere, yeah, I think this is the Starbucks uh, site. This assumes that Firestone goes away. Again, we've had no information and no indication of willingness of the owner uh, to sell it. So, so you, you can quickly uh, get the, you know, quick view that it's a very limited site, very limited development potential. What I didn't say earlier, and as planners, um, um, we use as a rule of thumb that for essentially every acre of development you get about, in terms of commercial development, you get about 10,000 square feet of, of, of retail or commercial or office development. And that for those of you who are into zoning more, that's roughly a 0.2 to a 0.25 FAR. Uh, and so with a limited site, with constraints it has, with the limited size, you, we're not talking about, even if it could be all commercial, we're not talking about substantial retail development. It's just not possible. Uh, this is the environment, the context on which the site uh, uh, sets. This is our location, approximately here. Those of you in the room, I'm sure, are very familiar with the location. 
Panfish Park, just to the south of it, that I'll mention in a minute. Some nearby residential uses, the closest on Pershing, a couple here, uh, about 430 feet to the closest point, and from this point, I think, over to, to Kingsbrook is about a, uh, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Kingsbrook is about 300 feet. All right, so now I'm going to give you a little summary of uh, the analysis of made with regard to the market. You're okay? Yeah, I guess you will do that. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate this wonderful turnout. Um, we were asked to look at the market for um, what could possibly happen here. So to do this, we were analyzing the feasibility of different kinds of development types for this and providing an economic reality check. It's one thing to be able to make pretty pictures, but we try to look at what could really happen here. So to do this, we evaluated the demographics of the village. We looked at this, some of the things that Con mentioned, the site access, the configuration, visibility of the parcel, and what the market conditions are for different types of uses. So I wanted to give you just a brief snapshot of um, Glen Ellen in terms of population and households. You've got not quite 28,000 residents, 10,500 households. Um, the village has an older population profile. The median age of 42 years tends to be on the older side of the Chicago metropolitan area, compared, which is not surprising because a lot of mature suburbs like Glen Ellen have an older population profile, people who have lived in their homes for a long time because it's a very desirable place to live. Um, what we found was that the population projections are pretty stable, not much of an increase, no decrease, and that significant growth is projected in the population over 65, which again, we're seeing that in a lot of communities, particularly older um, suburban areas in the Chicago metro area. So it's about a 16% increase projected in the population 65 and older, which is generally the aging of the baby boomers. Um, and then 30 to 44 year olds are also projected to see an increase, but of a lesser amount, 7%. Whereas all the other different age groups are shown, are projected to have a slight decrease in population. Um, as probably most of you um, are aware, Glen Ellen is an affluent area with median household income over 100,000, 119,000, which puts it definitely in the top of the Chicago metro area communities. 67% um, over two thirds earn over $75,000. However, on the opposite side, 15% earn under $35,000. So you do have, you know, there are people here who are in need of housing that is more affordable. Um, when we look at the income distribution for those over 65 and those under 65, we find that almost a quarter of the senior households have incomes over thir under $35,000. Now, many of those people do own their own homes. They probably own them outright because they've lived in them a long time, but they are living on um, retirement income but you know, there's still a significant percentage of the senior population. And then when we look at the households that are under 65, a little under 20% have incomes under $50,000. So again, it's not, while well, it's affluent, there are pockets and people who are not. Um, I wanted to put this slide up because it, I know there's been a lot of conversation about who might be eligible to live in affordable housing. And um, Glen Ellen falls within DuPage County and the Chicago metro area income limits. So as you can see here, basically the way the income limits work is by the number of people in the household so and by what percent of the area median income, which is also known as AMI for short. So basically for one person, the maximum that they could earn to live in affordable housing under some different programs that are out there would be 39,000 for one person, about 45,000 for two people. And then when you get up to the 80% of area median income, ranges from 52,000 up to almost 75,000 for a four person household. So it's the, any affordable housing that's built these days 
does not usually cater to the very lowest income people. It usually caters to people at this 60% of median income, sometimes people who have a little lower income than that, but you also have to be able to afford the rent. And the bottom of that slide shows what the maximum rents that somebody could, that a landlord could charge. And so again, when you look at this for one bedroom, it's a little over $1,000, um, two bedrooms, $1,258. So we're not, this is not talking about people who have section eight, this is not section eight housing, as some of you may think about in those situations, tenants pay 30% of their income in rent. So now wanted to look at what you know the market conditions are here in Glen Ellen. So retail, everybody knows that you know during COVID pandemic, people weren't shopping as frequently at stores. Everybody, I'm sure, if I asked how many people have shopped online in the last year, probably every single person would raise their hand in this room. Um, however, despite that, Glen Ellen has done pretty well. And when we look at um, Roosevelt Road. Um, we kind of look at different kinds of shopping areas and say, okay, how are they oriented? In this case, Roosevelt Road really serves the community of Glen Ellen. People who are looking to go to regional malls are not coming to Glen Ellen. You're going to Lombard or you're more likely going to Oak Brook to be able to shop for those things. So a community shopping area tends to have the day-to-day -day kinds of things, the grocery stores, the thing, the drug stores, some of the quick rest, quick serve restaurants, the things that people need day in, day out. And basically during the pandemic, those are the kinds of shopping centers and retail areas that did the best because people have needed to go to the grocery stores and you're very lucky you've got multiple you know, options here. So occupancy rates at shopping centers in Glen Ellen and along Roosevelt Road have generally been, been good compared to many other parts of the Chicago metro area. And you have good quality anchors here, which is obviously very important with, you know, Jewel and Trader Joe's and Aldi's and um, Ross, Staples, you know, and then you've got the Starbucks and Chipotle and Panera that are also very popular. Wings, wing stop that uh, I was told is, uh, Village President's children's favorite uh, restaurant. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, when we look at the amount of square footage that you have in terms of retail here, it's about a million and a half square feet. Um, only about 4% was vacant. So that's really quite impressive compared to the metro area overall. When we look at the far west suburbs, which you're part of, it was a 15% vacancy rate as of the end of um, 2021. So the main vacancies, um, the fresh market, which I think is being filled, is, am I correct? That somebody's, somebody, too no? Early to tell. Too early to tell, okay. Um, and then um, Pickwick has about 20,000 square feet of space that's vacant, three different um, spaces there. Um, also, as far as the retail market and the potential, you know, to, we've talked to a lot of brokers, real estate brokers who work with retailers and, and developers, and all of them were very positive about the opportunities for additional retail space on Roosevelt Road. Could be a single tenant, which would be, you know, like one of the fast, fast casual restaurants that we already have here. It could be several stores or restaurants, or a, there's a small multi-tenant center. As Khan said, the fact that you only have the 125 foot Roosevelt Road frontage is clearly a negative <laughs> for um, developers. And the ultimate size of what you're gonna get would depend on how the space actually lays out. And that's something that Khan mentioned that um, Todd on our team will be looking at, particularly what kind of visibility some of the stores might have if they were set back from Roosevelt Road and what kind of access they would have. And that's, um, that has a big impact on the feasibility, both from a market standpoint and a financial standpoint. Um, so we thought that, we estimate demand could be anywhere from 15 to 25,000 square feet of retail space, but again, 
it really depends on what can fit there. And um, typically, rents are anywhere from about twenty to thirty-five dollars a square foot, which is typically how retailers are quoted. Um, rents a, a chain like a Starbucks or some others might pay a national chain might pay more, like thirty-five dollars or something a square foot. But independent retailers, the mom and pop retailers, really can't afford to pay rents that are that high because they just don't do the sales volumes that enable them to be able to pay that kind of rent. So moving on to the office market, um, that's been a problem, not just in Glen Allen, but all over, <laughs> you know. The pandemic made a lot of us realize that, gee, we don't have to commute downtown, we don't have to commute, you know, to Oak Brook or O'Hare or Naperville or whatever, and, um, you know, everybody's trying to figure out looking ahead what this is going to mean for the future of office space. Um, my guess is when all is said and done, it'll be more of a hybrid situation and um, there'll be people who definitely want to come into the office, some um, businesses that are going to require it, but a lot of them who are basically saying, if I can't get the staff to work in my office, but they want to work remotely, I'm willing to do something to accommodate them. So Glen L, the East West, Tollway has a very high vacancy rate, um, 20 plus percent vacancy. Um, this is in class A space, which is the best quality space, class B space, which is, you know, sort of older, older office buildings. And mostly what Glen Allen has is the class B older office buildings. You see that a little further east on, um, on Roosevelt Road. So you're not a regional office location. Those people are looking at Naperville and they're looking at Oak Brook. Um, some of the buildings along the tollway. So you've got a high vacancy rate right now in the village and um, you know everybody's sort of wondering what's going to happen with COVID. So nobody's looking to build a spec speculative office building which means a building that doesn't have tenants already in place. So any office development without a tenant in place is going to be very risky and developers are going to shy away from it, particularly at this location and given the site constraints. Now, you know, you never say never because there may be some owner occupants, you know, single tenant users that would find this particular location to be appropriate for them. So that's probably the only likely for office. So I would say of all the uses, I put that way down on the bottom. Getting into residential, we looked at um, rental as well as for sale market. And what we find is there's a very strong market for apartments in Glen Ellen um, and in this general market area, which we would consider to be including Wheaton and we, you know, also looking at um, Lombard to the east. You got very high occupancy rates and even the newer, you know, some of the newest properties that have opened up. And there's not really a lot of new apartment development or newer apartment development in Glen Allen compared to some other suburbs um, around here. You know, if you think about Lombard, which has built a lot of new apartment buildings, Class A apartment buildings, the best quality, Downers Grove has built quite a bit, um, quite a bit new in Naperville as well. Um, what we find is that these highest quality apartments generally are ones that go for over $1,500 a month for a one bedroom apartment. Um, they would basically serve a wide age range. You know, this is for people who are empty nesters and seniors, especially, you know, elevated buildings as opposed to walk up buildings. Um, in addition, you've got younger people starting out who are young professionals potentially who are working in offices around here people who grew up here that you know want to um, come back to give you a frame of reference um, your newest building <coughs> excuse me in downtown that just opened up one bedroom start at 1975 dollars two bedrooms start at three thousand one hundred seventy five dollars and go up to $3,975. So obviously those are pretty steep runs and they're pretty comparable to what you're seeing at the newer properties that are um, have opened up in Lombard and also one just opened up across the street from Oak Brook Shopping Center as well. 
So clearly these are not the kind of rents that somebody with more limited income and you know, $40,000, $50,000 that I showed you on that um, screen earlier would be able to afford. So we have what you know people call either affordable housing, workforce housing, attainable housing. They're all sort of the same general idea that we would be looking at people paying probably between $900 and $1,500 a month in rent. And those basically are targeting people with incomes from about $30,000 to $75,000 a month. So we find that there's definitely a need for more housing that would be for people in that income group as well as senior um, households who earn under $45,000 a month. And this is just gives you an idea of kind of what the incomes are for some of the people that are typically considered looking for workforce housing. So we have what the entry level, you know, starting wages and the median wage. And you can see some of these people, healthcare support or people who are CNAs basically, um, sales and related occupations are the people who are working in all of these businesses along Roosevelt Road basically and shopping centers. Um, the office administrative, administrative assistance, office support staff, personal care and service, and even people working in education the median salary of 50,000, 53,000 um, would qualify those people for um, certainly at 80% of the median area median income. When we look at the for sale market, we specifically focused on attached housing, either townhouses or condominiums, because clearly this is not an obvious location for single family detached housing. We feel that there's a very strong opportunity for some for sale townhouses or um, condo um, buildings potentially. Um, last year, the median price for all um, attached housing, townhouses, condominiums was $195,000. Um, the condos were less expensive, the median, because they tended to be older, 156000 Townhouses at the much higher end, $350,000 um, is what they tended to sell for. So, Talking to realtors who are active in the area, given sort of what's missing in Glen Ellen and the location here, they felt that probably, you know, in the middle price range would, would be extremely marketable. Obviously, being so close to all the shopping, Panfish Park is a real benefit um, for people. And you could have this potentially on the entire site, just on the Taft frontage and um, it could be like a row of townhouses, um, row houses, attached, detached, um, three to five story building potentially. So summing all of this up, obviously you've got a small site as Khan said, but brokers are very positive about potential for retail and residential development. Um, the negative of course is the lack of um, extensive uh, retail Frontage and the Firestone that blocks part of the site is a negative. Um, single or multiple retail or restaurant users, depending on the configuration. Um, you could have a mix of development types with retail on Roosevelt, residential behind, or it could be all residential, some kind of a combination of apartments, um, condominiums, or townhouses, whether it's affordable or market rate, all of those could be very marketable. So with that, I will turn it over to back to Khan, who will talk about uh, some of the other issues. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Um, I just want to pick up here and let you know that uh, we're now seeing, and you've seen uh, through this handout card, that there is a public engagement uh, app, a website, that we've created using what's called the social pinpoint platform and that uh, social pinpoint platform is simply an opportunity to what we call um, an idea wall we created an, a place where community comments can be posted and what we've done and you can see many when you go there you can see uh, many comments already there what we've done is we collected everything that was already provided to the village through its website and then populated this new application through social pinpoint it's a, a pretty simple application to get information uh, simply about the project, 
You'll get a link there that will direct you to the more information about the hotel property and much of what you've seen tonight, probably this presentation later, uh, posted uh, on the uh, Village website, a dedicated uh, location dedicated for this. And um, uh, it looks something like this. Uh, there are several topical areas that have been identified by uh, clicking on any one of those quote, buttons, uh, if you're support of housing, different types of housing, commercial, whatever it is, have comments on biking or transportation or access, you can click on that and then it'll take you right to the screen below it to leave your comment. Another nice feature of this, if you have a picture or some something you want to uh, comment on specifically, or maybe you've seen another project somewhere else and say, hey, I'd like to see this project here, uh, you can take a photo, uh, photograph of that, upload that photograph to the site, and that'll be available. There's also, like other social platforms, opportunity to like and dislike a comment, uh, and then comment on the comment. And so to start, to, well, to start a discussion, um, um, path, uh, if, if, uh, if you wanted to continue that, or just simply you know, make, make your, uh, your feelings known about what was already said. So that's available to you, and again, that will all be synthesized. And, and again, if you, when you do go to the Village link, you will also notice that the Village also has a a platform and a, a way that you can comment via the, the village website as well. So multiple opportunities, but we thought this was probably the easiest, most fun and engaging uh, way to do that because of the way that you can see comments, interact with comments, and so forth, and then easy for us to then to kind of distill and, if you will, analyze and tabulate the results later. So uh, that's uh, one option. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about now is with regard to the overall process. Tonight, as you know, is just the very beginning of a multi-month process, some of which, as you already uh, are aware of, has been going on for several months, and of course a lot of that as a result of the word Valerie's already done. Uh, there is uh, going to be a, a charrette, which is a, a, um, a, a process where we're inviting a limited number of uh, uh, village uh, officials and the representatives of the commission and the community to work closely with us uh, in developing and coming up with ideas for what could work on the site. And so it's really, think of it as a brainstorming uh, uh, process where you're looking at real world examples of actual developments, applying those to the site and talking about what would work, what would not work, and, and using that as a way to build consensus, to educate the members who are going to be ultimately making the decisions some of which are the information you've already had uh, yourself tonight, and then using that in an engaging way so that the community leaders, in this case, come together, rather than us as consultants, the typical way, right, it would be done. We take the information from a meeting like this, we go back, produce some pretty drawings, bring them back to the board and, or officials and say, we like this, we don't like that, go back to the table, and you can see that happening you know, five or six times. This shortcuts the process and creates an opportunity, and, and I've done this numerous times, and have always find it to be uh, uh, helpful in the sense that it not only brings new ideas to the tables, the ones that we may not have thought of, but more importantly, uh, creates an opportunity for people to work together. In some cases, people say, you know, we've never really had that opportunity to sit down with a map in front of us with ideas to actually come together. And, and, and often in case, you know, disparate views, which we always said is fine. Um, and we welcome the disparate views. So we're gonna record all the comments it isn't the idea that we have to achieve consensus at this charrette. It's simply a process to engage um, the uh, key officials in that process. And that information then will be taken together with this information uh, uh, and then synthesized. And then there will be a point as the consultant team, as I mentioned earlier, Todd and I will have to be Knox and I and Valerie will be working together then to take that input and then apply it to the site and come up with our uh, scope calls up to five up to five different alternatives uh, for the site to see what would make sense. And the whole purpose of this, if you remember what the goal of the process is, is to see the site redeveloped. And uh, as the, the village, being the current owner, has to go through a public process to offer that property essentially to the, the larger development community um, and, and, and to make that a public, you know, transparent process. But the development community also wants to understand, uh, and, and especially you know, the top flight developers, are not going to waste their time in Glen Allen if you don't have a, at least a sense of a, a path or a clear idea of an option, or maybe more than one option that might be acceptable to the community, and also, of course, that works. And, uh, and that's going to bring, we believe, the better developers to the table. 
Uh, once we do that, and so you know, uh, in addition to what the mayor had already described as other public listening sessions coming, there are certainly more opportunities for you as a community to track what's going on via the village website, via the, the, the project app, uh, and we're gonna be bringing those conceptual plans to the plan commission for their input and comment and further refinement. And you know, ultimately they may eliminate some, they may like all five of them and we'll keep them in the proposal. We, we don't know how it's gonna go. Uh, and then ultimately it comes to the board. So the planning commission will take a, uh, a chance at doing it. It'll be a public meeting. The board will do something similar, same opportunity for you to do that. Now we're also gonna use social pinpoint in a different way at this point. So it's gonna be redone and customized so that you as a community, meaning the entire community, will have an opportunity to comment on the five alternatives. Even if you can't show up at a planning commission or village board meeting, you can go to this site and comment in the same way that you're doing or can do uh, after tonight on specific alternatives. I'd like this, I don't like that, or, you know, why didn't you think of this, whatever it might be. Um, and so that's gonna be another way that will be uh, an opportunity for you to get directly involved and, and really, you know, obviously the great opportunity that, that these apps provide is it's not just people like you know, I mean, they can come to these meetings, but young families and others and, and elderly that can't make these kind of meetings uh, can still have that same access, right? So. That's, that's the great advantage of, of these kinds of apps. All right, um, yeah, with that, I just want to talk a little bit more, as I said, about the purpose of this process. So once we go through that and we have a sense of direction from the community, if you will, then we're gonna package that information in what's called a developer RFQ. And the illustration here is a project I was involved in many years ago with the village of Schiller Park and the redevelopment of a site near O'Hare Field. It packages in a, in a sense like a brochure, an RFP that goes out to the development community uh, that establishes what um, the community wants, what the parameters will be, what the potential uh, uh, system will be, if, if anything, what the kind of uses might be. There will be a developer selection process. Uh, the developers will be, uh, once we receive the RFPs, there will be a sifting down of maybe two, three, four that will actually interview as a uh, team working with your staff and then bring that recommendation and that analysis to the board and the board will then review and potentially, typically you know, narrow it down to one or two that they'll uh, interview and then ultimately select a developer to negotiate what we call the developer agreement. Basically saying who does what, who pays for what, what are the terms of the, the deal and so forth. And then that's the, the process uh, in, in its entirety. Uh, we hope to complete that at the end of the year, but the mayor has made it clear to me there is no magic number, and based on how this, or date I should say, and based on how this process goes, it may take longer. Uh, I mean, or maybe, you know, maybe we could end it earlier, but right now we think it's reasonable to think that we can get this done at, uh, at the end of the year. So, at this point, some comments I have, unless there's any questions. Oh, I do wanna, I'm sorry, Mayor, just one thing I wanna clarify was, uh, someone made a comment. Um, I, I think I, miss, I may have misspoke earlier in a point I made in the presentation. Uh, in the current uh, C3 zoning district for the property, I think I mentioned uh, that uh, senior housing was a special use currently, and that's not the case. The only way housing uh, could be uh, done if it was rezoned. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Con, and, and thank you, Valerie. I think you can see uh, the contribution that they bring to this discussion. I am sure that many of you may have questions, uh, but again, this is not really a question and answer session. That does not mean you should not ask your questions because we are gonna be keeping track of those questions and then we will kind of assemble those into a frequently asked question kind of packet uh, and then we'll publish that back out to the community so that you get a response to some of the questions that you have. So if you do have a question, please let us know what it is. Uh, but don't expect that it's going to be answered tonight. We just frankly don't have that kind of time uh, given the amount of public comment that I think we're going to be hearing. Um, so, Manager France, do you have any other comments? Just uh, 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 good see, evening. Name, address? Yes, Keith Lavin, uh, 116 South Ellen, Lally. Um 21 year resident. Uh, I want to be front with you and say thank you for taking care of this situation. Um, this building in question is in sight from my driveway every day. Um, I hate to say, we've seen drug deals in the gas station and then people walk back to the, the, hostage, the hotel afterwards. So, thank you. Uh, but let's talk about Glen Ellen. Uh, real estate market right now in town is stretched thin. 
Uh, you have 31 listings. That's a month's inventory, ranging from 300,000 to 2.2 million. Uh, the current model in this town is to squeeze as many new houses into as small a spot as possible. You narrow the roads, you give them nine, yard, uh, nine foot backyards is what you're approving. Uh, I don't want to have a nine foot backyard. As you build, you create additional stress on our infrastructure. That means more cars on the road, that means you put more cheeks in the seats at the school. Um, recently, Glen Ellen's been in the process of buying these properties. I want to go back to the, the Five Corners. When you bought the Five Corners, you had eventually an idea brought up to put in a gas station. You took out a gas station, you, put up, you had a proposal for a new gas station. You had a huge surge from the north side saying, you can't build it there, the benzene fumes. Forest Glen is a thousand feet away. We don't want to put the students at that risk. But yet, from what I understand, residential is definitely a, a possibility in this location. And you're talking an even shorter distance than what you had on the north side. Um, so there's just that. Um, um, I bring this up again. Um, you buy this bladed property. Uh, to bring something better. Um, I, I, I want to ask a question or put this out there because from people I've talked to and websites that I've gone to that have talked about this project, it is stated, and I quote, it is the express goal of the village to put attainable housing in this location. I, are we having it? Is a decision already been made, or is this just a facade? Um, we have we have concerns just like any other community. Um, in this location, if you decide to put residential there, I have a question for you: Is have you done a traffic study? How many car accidents have occurred at Taft and Park in the last six months? I'm going to tell you plenty on Park Boulevard. How many pedestrians have been hit by a car on Park Boulevard? I can tell you five names in the last 20 years, including a death. Your idea of putting attainable workforce housing in that location with the idea that it's a walkable community to the shopping center, you're putting them at a risk. Um, my tax bill, since the time that we moved in, 20 years ago has gone up $5,000. Now, on this side of town, it might mean something. On the other side of town, maybe not. We get shorted on this side so much. You know what I would love? I would love to know how many sit-down restaurants do we have on the south side of Roosevelt Road? We have four. On Main Street in Glen Ellen, in just a few blocks, you have nine. Do we have quality retail on this side of town? Not really. I will just kind of finish up here. Um, let's see. Sorry about this. The first one is not easy. Um, we need quality re uh, retail options just like downtown. We need safe walking routes just like downtown. We need quality eateries just like downtown. Now, what we don't need here are any more fast food restaurants. We don't need any more banks. We don't need any more vape shops. Many of the board members up here cite that their pride in this town goes along with friendly shopkeepers, historic charm, unique shops, restaurants, and great community events. Now, being here 20 years, that doesn't sound like south of Roosevelt. So I'd really like some of those things that you really love about our town to be on our site too. Thank you. So I'm gonna violate my first rule, which was not to answer any questions. Okay? But Keith brings up one that I've heard enough that I wanna kinda of put it to rest right here and now. The idea that this decision has been made. I, I can assure you, you wouldn't be here if this decision had been made. Um, we all have our own views on what this should or shouldn't be, and that is, and the trustees I'm sure do too, okay? 
But in this village, I'll tell you how you know a decision's been made. When there is a vote that is taken by the board and you get more than three votes in favor of something. So that has not occurred relative to this site. And until it does, no decision has been made. Um, the purpose of inviting our consulting friends here and of having you here is to find out what to do and to develop some alternatives, ideally five, uh, that we can consider for this particular site. One of those will be an affordable housing consideration. But that is just one of many that we're going to consider. Um, so for those of you who think the decision's been made, I assure you it has not. Go right ahead. Hello, everyone. First of all, um, I really want to shout out and thank the village for having this kind of... I'm sorry. Can you hear me? My name is Sarah Allen, and I live at 822 Abbey Drive in Mary Knoll. I live about five minutes away from this property, and on my way to driving around Glen Ellen, probably go by it three times a day. I have lived in Glen Ellen for 36 years, and I'm speaking tonight on the behalf of the Lee Wim voters of Glen Ellen. I'd like to start out again, and thank you for reminding me, President, that I really appreciate the uh, village coming forward and having a venue where you have people can come, it's accessible, and let people have a sense that they have a voice. And so I really want to thank you for having this. So, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Glen Ellen, we urge Village President Mark Senek and the Village Trustees to prioritize your earlier expressed goal of developing a portion of the recently purchased Roosevelt Road site as affordable housing. The League of Women Voters of Glen Ellen's position on affordable housing states in part, quote, safe, quality, affordable housing is essential to the health and well-being of individuals, families, and the community. Our position further states that deliberate planning can result in housing that appeals to and is affordable for people with a wide range of incomes and lifestyles, and it promotes a vibrant, welcoming community. Based on this position, which the League of Women Voters of Glen Ellen first drafted in 1994, and most recently re-updated it in 2021. The League of Women Voters of Glen Ellen has advocated for years to have affordable housing throughout our community. Recent League advocacy helped the village trustees when approving the Glenwood Station development to be built on the former McChesney Miller property, decide that the village will cover a portion of the rent for two units of affordable housing for a period of 10 years in that building. For League of Women voters, this is not a North or South Glen Ellen issue. This is an issue for all of Glen Ellen to make affordable and attainable housing available to lower income wage earners, our seniors, and to those with intellectual and developmental disabilities so they can remain in the community in which they grew up, where they can flourish and contribute as adults to this community. The village of Glen Ellen in 2022 has a real opportunity to set the course for affordable housing availability in Glen Ellen. And we urge you to do so. And we thank you so much for hearing our comments. And thank you all for coming because it's so important to be engaged in our community. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Lander, I live at, in Bill Park, 802 South Mill Avenue. Um, I have a nephew, Jeremy Oppenheimer, who was diagnosed as bipolar four years ago. And he's, he lives on the northwest side of Chicago, but over the last four years, he has had to struggle to find good quality affordable housing. And uh, he's moved to three different places in that time. But he lives independently and he's very successful in his job. And um, he knows he has to take his medication. 
I, I just hope that uh, someone else who has a family member that uh, is bipolar or has some other mental health condition um, that wants to work, live in his community would uh, offer that type of a housing. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alex Evans. Um, uh, to put a positive on, my question is, I am moved. I am moved to Canadian. I wish I had more. My name is Cheryl Peters. I live at 322 Miller Court. For more years than I'm going to say, um, <laughs> but I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the First United Methodist Church of Glen Ellen, which is located at Forest and Duane. We in the United Methodist Church support the basic right of all persons to equal access to housing. We value an economically diverse community. We are in support of developing the site between Roosevelt Road and Taft to include affordable, attainable, and supportive housing. We believe this will benefit persons with limited incomes or a need for supportive services. And we also believe having affordable, attainable, and supportive housing will benefit our whole community. Thank you. Hi, all. Um, my name is Rini Atchison. I live at 66 Forest Avenue in Glen Ellen. Um, I've been a resident my whole life. Uh, my parents chose to live here. Um, they raised, raised me in South Glen Ellen. Uh, grew up on um, Glen Valley Drive. Had four siblings. Um, my husband and I chose to raise our kids here as well. Sorry. Um, as a career real estate agent, I've worked with many families who choose Glen Ellen for their community, like my parents before me. I chose to make Glen Ellen my adult home. It's important to me that each of my sons has a place, has a choice in where they live as adults. My 25-year-old son, Robert, is here tonight. Stand up, Robert. Robert has Down syndrome. He lives works, plays, attends school, worships, votes, and volunteers in Glen Ellen. He spent his entire life building his community here. It's what he knows and loves. Glen Ellen is where he chooses to live alongside with his peers and near his family. Robert and many of his peers with intellectual and developmental disabilities and other disabilities need supportive housing to live their best, most independent lives outside of their family homes before parents or caregivers are unable to take care of them. Supported housing means having individualized support for the tasks of daily, daily living. So there are all types of affordable housing. The need is great, not only in Glen Ellen, but across our state and nation. In Illinois, more than 14,000 individuals remain on a wait list for adult funding and wait lists for supportive housing are growing. In Glen Ellen alone, we have 320 individuals plus with intellectual disabilities living with their aging parents. And Glen Ellen only has one, um, excuse me, 
only has one sort of supported housing option that I know of for this audience. I will say my girlfriend bought the house, has three adults in the house. I intended, that's why I went into real estate 22 years ago, thinking I'd do the same thing. It does, it's, it's not easy to do. Families can't afford it. It's huge, it's a big pressure. It's just, it's just not something we're gonna do anymore, um, our family personally. So, that's a group home for just three individuals in our entire community, okay? Most continue to live with their families or move away from Glen Allen to find supportive housing options. Lamb's Farm, Misericordia, Little Friends in Naperville. Not Glen Allen, it's not where they are. Glen Allen's losing valuable, contributing citizens who wish to stay here by their families, by, who wish to stay here by, by, sorry. We can do better as a community. Please prioritize supportive housing in Glen Allen, not only at the Roosevelt Road Taft Avenue site, but whenever possible throughout the village. And I think if you all live next to a group home or knew someone with special needs who can never ever live alone, and they can't make a, a living wage as well. You have to understand that. They cannot make more than $2,000 ever in their bank account, ever. So if we go over $2,000, we get red flagged and our services get taken away and we get fined and we pay back. So what you have to understand is there's all kinds of affordable housing. Glen Ellen needs supportive housing. And Mark, I know everyone in this room is probably sick as hell of me saying it. There's a, I know half this room. Half this room. All right. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nick Nelson. I am a member of the South Glen Ellen Community Development Not-for-Profit Organization. I, I thank everyone in the board and the village for this opportunity to speak tonight. I guess first I'd like to say to the families here who are in support of uh, supportive housing and who need that, I want you to know that myself and I believe the vast majority of the people in our group, we're not trying to excise you from the community. In fact, I think you would find that in many situations and many times, you would have a really strong ally in us. But it's in fact, our group is the exact opposite. We're trying to uplift the entire community and South Glen Ellen needs that. And I've spoken to many of you, I know some of you incredibly well, and I've heard a lot of what you had to say and it's been a very educational process. But one thing that I'm worried about and that I've observed is your desperation to help your family and support your family is blinding the fact that you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Just because this site is available for development and it's an open opportunity, doesn't mean that it's the best fit or even a good fit. Let's talk about real world. The consultant used that term. I drive Roosevelt Road all the time, going into Chicago, going out to St. Charles in Geneva. You know what I don't see a lot on Roosevelt Road? A thriving residential community. It's just not, it doesn't fit there. And let's also talk about the fact that this location would be a residential island. It is entirely surrounded by commercial buildings and commercial units. My office, besides being a resident of Glen Ellen, my office is in Glen Ellen. 
from my conference room, I look at this site. It is not, it does not scream residential opportunity. It, you're in between a gas station and a tire change place. So when we talk about the housing that's needed here in Glen Ellen, how many of you would like to buy a townhouse right next to a Shell gas station, and on the other side, you can hear tires being changed all day and into the evening? If you were honest with yourselves, the truth is you wouldn't. And this is going to become a, a place that is not desirable. It is not a desirable residential location. That is why it's always been zoned commercial, and that's why it's still zoned commercial. It serves that purpose, and it's on Roosevelt Road. You know, when I see what is going on here in Glen Ellen, here's a, another fact. Glen Ellen has 60% more affordable housing than were required by mandate. We have affordable housing in this community. If you look at the comparable communities in DuPage County, in some cases we have four times more affordable housing. This community has not turned a blind eye to the underserved community. We've done the exact opposite. We have more affordable housing, we've embraced them in our schools, we've raised taxes just to support that influx of students and their needs and to keep our schools great. Now, Here's another thing that I, I came up during the previous conversations that really kind of shocked me. You talked about taxes and the taxation. Well, a lot of those seniors who have lower incomes are being driven out of Glen Ellen because the homes they own are overtaxed. They can't afford the taxes. Now we're talking about doing a, yet another charitable goal with this property which will put increased burdens on our school, which will result in raised property taxes, and will force out many of those senior long-term residents. And I think it's especially important that we talk about the schools. I have two daughters. They have gone through Parkview Elementary and are in Glencrest Junior High right now. The schools in South Glen Ellen need the funding. They're at max capacity, and this location on Roosevelt Road and just off of Roosevelt Road is a great financial opportunity for the schools. An underperforming hotel is still giving the schools a lot of money from that location. Can you only imagine what a successful use of that property can do for our schools and our community? I think it would be a great windfall for them. I have seen millions of dollars being discussed for downtown Glen Ellen with luxury developments and high rises and TIF money. Let's do that same development on Roosevelt Road. Let's do that same development for South Glen Ellen. It was, I picked up in earlier meetings this month that the Village Links had a record year when it came to finances. Reserve 22 has just been booming. And the, the consultants tonight described how successful Glen Allen is doing at bringing in commercial business and described it as a high in comparison to other ones. That tells me that this is a chance for a great commercial site. And if the village prioritizes South Glen Allen and Roosevelt Road, we can see a great economic success and opportunity at that site. I guess the last thing I'd like to say is just address something that President Senek said that we're one village. I wish that was true. I lived down by Lake Ellen for 10 years before moving over here to South Woodland. And it doesn't feel like one village. It should be, it needs to be, and it needs to change and start being that way. But it is treated different. And we are going, the, our group is coming with facts, data, and information. And I hope that an objective, careful, observation and analysis is done for this property. And yes, it is frustrating when we hear groups saying that an express goal of the village was affordable housing at this site. That's disheartening to me. It's disheartening to a lot of my neighbors. And we wanna know that we're going to have a fair opportunity to be heard because we're coming with information, facts, not emotions. I'm getting the red light from President Senek, so I'll wrap it up. But I do wanna say, 
the village has spent just over $3 million when it's all said and done at this property of your money, taxpayer money. We need to get a return on that investment. We need to do something that is going to lift up the entire community. This can't be an emotion-based decision that's going to make us feel good. This has to genuinely help everyone. Thank you. Tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, my name's Seth Carey. Uh, I uh, live on uh, 1220 South Prospect Street uh, in Wheaton, south of Roosevelt Road. Uh, I'm the senior pastor of the First Congregational Church of Glen Ellen, where I've served for 16 years or so. Um, Nick's right. I think this, uh, this can't be an emotion-driven conversation, but I think it can be a conscience driven conversation. Um, I humbly uh, attempt here to speak for the conscience of the village. I know that's a little arrogant, but I'm a pastor, it's what I do. Um, I have a lot of people in my community uh, that I talk to all the time, you know, who would really benefit. Not just It's not just about the affordability, it's not just affordable housing. Yeah, there, there are a lot of affordable housing options, as has been said. There aren't a lot of supportive uh, or accessible options that are also affordable. Um, you know, I've got seniors who, as it was said, can't you know afford their property taxes. They have to move. They're going to move out of town. You know, they're going to be away from their kids or, or their community. They need a place that's affordable and supportive. I've got parents with special needs kids. Same situation. I've got single moms. You know, um, these are all people who already have community here and who want to be a part of this community and who want to stay here. Um, and, and I think they have a right, you know, to be here. And, uh, and we have a responsibility to make, to make room for everyone who wants to be here. Um, it's been said, um, you know, that uh, we have to focus on practical matters, and I think that's true. But we also have to think about what the right thing to do is. And when faced with uh, a dilemma of this scale, I always ask myself, what would love do? You know, what's the loving response? Um, and you know, I, I know I'm not in Glen Ellen, I live in Wheaton, but I'm south of Roosevelt Road. I work north of Roosevelt Road. Um, I don't know, I feel like the whole, <laughs> this whole north-south divide is just, you know, it has gotten a little out of hand. Um, we are all one community. Um, we strive to be one community. If there's great restaurants north of Roosevelt Road, they're five minutes away. You know, um, we're all part of the same same town here. So, I guess I would uh, again. I want to thank the the village and the board for all the hard work you're doing. But I would say my question would be: if not this site then where? And if not now, then when? Thank you. Hi, I'm David Fersha. I live in One Way in South Ellen. My front door has opened towards Four Seasons for 51 years. I've seen more trouble come out of that motel than most. Unfortunately, it really wasn't bad till the 90s. But let's go back to the 70s. My dad fought village to mow Panfish Park for almost 20 years before they mowed it. I love hearing people get up here and talk about building all this and that and oh yeah we'll take care of Panfish Park. I heard that with the police station, I heard that with the townhouses. I went to all those meetings, those decisions were made before we got to those meetings and I really hope and I pray that you guys have not made the decision on this. You tore down my grade school, Wagner School, the best grade school in Glen Ellen. That was an awesome school. I had the best growing up. I could have lived in a better town and a better place. My grandparents and my aunts and my uncles all lived in the north side. We were not allowed to swim at Sunset Pool until 1978. If you were south of Roosevelt Road, you did not swim at that pool. And then you got to buy a pass at full price at that, even being a resident. Boy, I like that. Um, plus, you had to have short hair, too. <laughs> we, we had a great time. 
having Panfish Park across the street from our house. We really did. Um, in the 90s, these people start getting vouchers from churches, drugs, alcoholics. I myself am an alcoholic. I've been sober for 23 years. Yeah. And my... <laughs> I share a lot of AA meetings. I'm not an addict, but I see so many addicts, and I've lost so many good friends. I've seen people die in our park. I've seen a person murdered in our park. Things I never want to see, no one ever should see in their town. What fueled the people to be able to stay at that motel was these good-hearted people at these churches with these vouchers. I was one of them that enabled people to live there, not worry about rent or bills or work or anything. I think you owe it to your community for having let that go on for so long. We paid the police out of the taxpayer's dollar to be there six, eight, 10, 12 times a day. I can see it from my front window. My parents, my dad, God bless him, he would have been 100 years old this St. Patty's Day. He loved the way the people. You probably all knew my dad. <laughs> he sat at the corner and he, he just loved people. He loved the town. He's a World War II vet. He ran for village president in 1976. They couldn't afford to live in Glen Ellen anymore when they got old. So I moved back home and it helped them. I'm so lucky to have came back home to my parents when they needed me the most and helped them. I now own their house. I have a six-year-old boy. I never want him to see some of those bad things. Low-income housing, I don't care how you disguise it, it brings in government checks, vouchers, and the unwanted people. If there was some way around that I have a kind heart and I like to help every single person out there. But you know what? I don't feel like fueling the same thing that just came from there. I would like to see something for our community. I think you have the right owner. I think the village going on how to put a pole, tennis courts. We should have our sunset pole. I think the park should be fixed up. I think investing into our community and our people in a good way would be the best thing we could possibly do. No housing, no residence at all. I would rather have a research lab there or a wet market. <laughs> uh, my name is Kevin McGrain. And uh, I live on Amber Ridge, across from Glencrest. Uh, I want to thank Mark and uh, the rest of the members here for having us out here today. Um, we've heard it a couple times that you know there were some preconceived notions and guarantees or thoughts on what this property was going to be, and we've been assured that that is not the case. And I take them at their word. Um, I'm up here advocating that we do not want residential at this site. We've had numerous problems there in the six years I've lived here, and as you've heard before, uh, for years before that. I think it's time that we get something there after putting up with the countless uh, days, weeks, months of police blockades there because they're looking for a gun in the pond or something like that. We deserve some real investment there. Um, it's not ideal for residential. It's next to a gas station. It's next to a Firestone auto mechanic shop, which we've already heard. It's on a busy road that is loud, has lots of traffic, and it's next to a veterinarian that is barking dogs outside throughout the day. And when that goes by there, you will hear them. D89 recently had a tax, tax referendum, and the residents who live within the D89 boundaries are already taxed at the highest percentages in Glen Allen. The south side of Glen Allen has both the Village Links Golf Course and COD, both huge properties that limit our area's ability to bring in property taxes that could alleviate the high taxes we're already paying. We're worried that already struggling families and seniors will not be able to stay in their homes. They need tax relief too. So commercial use, which this property is currently zoned for, is the most suitable use for this location. Downtown Glen Ellen has numerous restaurants, bars, businesses that make it both an attractive place to go but also to collect tax, re tax revenue. The south side of Glen Ellen is severely lacking when, it comes com when it's compared to these areas in downtown and on the north side. Reserve 22, as it was mentioned, brought in record tax revenue recently, and now we finally have the ability to bring a new restaurant, a brew pub, a music venue, 
or any type of commercial use business that would give residents on the south side of Glenelg somewhere to go and help increase the tax receipts that, that are severely lacking on the south side. For those advocating ADA housing in Glenelg, I agree with you. I think having housing and services for ADA residents would be a great asset to our community. I just agree, disagree on the location for the reasons I already stated. All of the recent condos and apartments that have been built in downtown Glen Ellen, over 200 plus units, have been tailored solely to those with the means to pay high rents. However, there are two areas yet to be developed, most notably at the US Bank site. This is a prime location for all the reasons people choose to pay the high rents to live downtown. I would wholeheartedly support ADA housing in that location and would be both an advocate and a supporter for that cause. The uh, pastor that was up there, just up here said, if not now, when, if not where, that's a perfect site. The last thing I wanna say is, and you've heard some of the speakers mention it, do we really want Glen Ellen to be a north versus south side community? Because that's the direction we're going. When we continue to see all the investments on the north side of town and the lopsided investment on the south side. Of those 200 units built or being built in downtown, only three or four units were set aside for attainable housing. Think about that. Three or four out of 200. Yet those advocating for this site want all or most to be affordable housing. Does that sound proportional to you? Does that sound equitable to you? Well, that's how we feel on the south side. Thank you. Well, I want to give an observation <clears throat> that I think you all have. Everyone in this room loves Glen Ellen. Yeah. Yeah. Is that not true? You all love Glen Ellen, right? We wouldn't be here unless we had a vested interest in this community. I have questions, and they are all about terminology because we toss around words and we may not even understand them. One of the words that's being used is affordable. Another one I have heard is subsidized. Another one I have heard is attainable. I think it would benefit all of us if we really knew the definitions of those words and what goes along with it before we make any decisions. <clears throat> I don't know if you all know the difference. And then I heard another word being used today uh, was supportive. What's the difference between all of those? I think we need to clarify terms. <clears throat> One thing that was not mentioned, and it was sort of said, oh, we'll talk about that later, was Pantfish Park. <clears throat> I am. Um, part of the townhouses by Panfish Park. But you never said what it was you were gonna talk about, about Panfish Park. May I ask, I think someone brought it up, and I think you did bring it up. Uh, Constantine, is that correct? I think you brought that up, but nothing was said. So can you answer that question? Really quick. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, sure. And and, and that's uh, that's accurate. Uh, in my rush to in that eyesight, I, I, I did forget to mention that one of the um, issues with regard to Panfish Park is that provides stormwater detention for a large area, and in particular this site and the properties along Roosevelt Road. And so the point I was trying to make is that Panfish Park has a particular benefit for this property because it, we don't have to provide stormwater detention on site. It's already provided there. So is there anyone who can give the definitions? Because that, I really want to know the difference in definitions. <clears throat> we, we're not going to do that tonight. But okay. We're not going to do that. It just, it's a longer discussion. For All right. Time, because I would appreciate that. And I think, I think many people would appreciate yeah. knowing the differences between all of those. It's a very good point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pete Latisic, as uh, Mark said. Uh, I'm a 55-year uh, Glen Ellen resident. I served with uh, our police department for 20 years, and I'm a three-term village trustee. 
Uh, I bring that up because I'm very familiar with this community, very familiar with this site. Um, one of the things I learned on the village board was that we have very that we have very limited uh, we have very limited um, tax generating properties in the village, um, and it would be uh, uh, quite an oversight to um, to take this property and not take advantage of the retail tax generating um, ability that this property has. Um, in uh, development, you look at uh, and in, in municipal management, you look at the highest and best use. Um, you know, again, being along our Roosevelt Road corridor, um, and the fact that this is just uh, re um, zoned retail and commercial, um, we need to take advantage of that. Um, I'm currently a, de a developer and a home builder. Um, I, I buy and sell homes, um, uh, and many of the homes that I buy, I buy from elderly residents that can't afford to live here because of the taxes. Um, we could give away properties in our community, and people couldn't afford to live here because of our property taxes. Um, one of the ways that we can erode that, um, or at least, at least flatten that, uh, is to uh, maximize our uh, retail uh, development properties. Um, I support affordable housing. Um, I personally support many of our uh, charitable and uh, faith-based organizations, outreach community ministries, uh, bridge communities, um, CHAD, Habitat for Humanity, Tunnels to Towers. I spend much of my time uh, doing hurricane relief work from coast to coast. Um, so I, I support the, uh, the effort. It's a very noble uh, effort. Uh, but again, um, this building, uh, this, this site is, is just a poor site for that type of development. Um, we could look at this building. Um, you know, years ago, the, 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 you know, we could put affordable housing or some sort of attainable or functional housing on this site, but it just wouldn't be the highest and best use of this land. Uh, years ago, this, this building that we're in uh, today, actually not this building, but a few feet away when this building didn't exist, this was an underutilized site. Um, it, it served as stormwater retention for, for this area, but it didn't generate any, uh, didn't, in fact, I don't think it generated much of any retail sales tax, um, which it certainly does now. Um, the, you know, that, that property has, has already been pointed out is, is, is not safe. Um, it, it, as someone mentioned, it, it would be a residential island. Um, it, it, it wouldn't generate tax revenue, and in fact, it then may be a tax burden to uh, not just the community, but the school districts that it, it's housed in. Um, there are ideal affordable housing sites. There are some downtown. I believe there's a church property downtown that may, may come for sale. Um, you know, so there, there are some, um, some ideal properties um, that, that do have uh, access. Um, I think that's about it. Um, I, I want to point out just a couple quick things. Uh, this process seems to have been hijacked a little bit by a, a, a local uh, political activist organization. Um, and some of those um, activists aren't even Glen Ellen residents. Um, so I would suggest that, uh, that we require names and addresses on the surveys, even if it was a survey monkey and the survey, the, the data collectors for the survey um, has that information. It doesn't even know publicly. And then that we post um, the Glen Ellen stats on affordable housing types, as was mentioned by one of the previous speakers, and the definitions of uh, many of those uh, phrases that were thrown out in the scene. But uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for your time and yourselves as well. My name is my name is Tom Eilers. I'm with the Pickford Shopping Center, and I thought I was signing an attendance sheet, not a speaking sheet. <laughs> Uh, Valerie mentioned that we had uh, 20,000 square feet vacant at Pickwick, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to just, uh, in a minute or less, explain to you that Pickwick has acquired over the last five years several buildings between Binney's and Park, and we are working with our land planners and consultants to determine and discern which buildings we will keep and which buildings we will retrofit and which buildings and which sites will have new construction. And of course, nothing we propose is going to go anywhere without the blessing of your planning commission and your village board. But I just wanted to explain that of that 20,000 square feet, only 6,000 square feet is really available for lease because we have a pretty good idea of which buildings we will be uh, tearing down. So I just thought I'd take this opportunity to explain to the community why the property looks the way it is. It's not because we're not paying attention. It's because we're trying to make a significant capital contribution. Staff is welcome to give out my contact information to anyone who would like to comment to me about Pickwick. And I think that you are very lucky to have a village board that has such an open process for this 
the site, I think it would make a great contribution to the community. Thank you. They don't want to put a Baptist preacher up here with a microphone. <laughs> anyway, uh, my name is Jim Shannon. Uh, I live at 23 West 235 Edgewood Court in Glen Allen. That's unincorporated Glen Allen. But my church is at 670 South Lambert Road in Glen Allen. Uh, so, I have two residents in Glen Island. My wife, she has spent more time at the church than at the house. But anyway, that's a long story. But anyway, I, I just want to say that um, I'm working in housing for so many years. A community has to replace itself every 10 years with residents. And that's something we need to think about is to how will Glen Allen replace itself? Uh, one of the best things that my wife and I did was to purchase a house in Glen Allen, which now is worth three times as what we paid for. Now, how did that happen? First of all, we moved in an apartment in a community that we felt that we would like to eventually live in. Got a feel for the community. We lived here. Uh, my two children have gone through the Glen Park School System and both of them are college graduates now. It was a great opportunity for us to move in an integrated community uh, with loving people. And I think we need to, to, to think about making that possible for so many other people. In my church, we have seniors who, who need to downsize. We ha and this is not Section 8, by the way. It was stated that. Section 8 is when the government subsidized the rent up to 70% and the residents only pay 30%. So, so that may be something you may need further down the road, but this is not what that is. This is uh, supplying a place where families can live and work and get started. When my wife and I first rented an apartment, we couldn't afford to buy a house. So we rented an apartment in a community that we thought would be a good place for us to live. And that's what this could provide, a place where seniors could downsize, a place where people who physically challenged could live, and a place where young working people uh, can also find a place to live. Uh, the Kentucky Fried Chicken over on Naperville Road is, is no longer there. It's a Starbucks now. Do you know why that place closed? They could not find people to work in Glen Allen. The, the owner used to bus people from Harvey, Illinois, to have them working here in Glen Allen. Then the, they just gave up. They couldn't find people to work here and live here in Glen Allen. Now, you got, now, they made my case. I, I have four pages that I was going to talk about. You. But when I saw the, the thing on the, on the screen, it made my point. You don't have a place where young families can start and afford. You don't have a place where seniors can downside. You don't have that. You need it on a place where there's uh, bus stops, where people can walk and people can do, and you have that. Uh, so, and, and also you have a place where people can, can live and can be affordable. So I can tell you right now, my church is in total support of having this site. Uh, and, and, and by the way, just because the hotel turned into be a bad site, it doesn't speak that the affordable housing would turn to be a bad site. Come on now. You know, we can use better logic than that, can we? But I just think this would be a great idea that you would give young working families an opportunity to come here and live. And we won't have to have businesses go out because you walk into McDonald's, you think it's a senior citizen's place now because that's all they can find to work there. You know, in, in the McDonald's and different places around there. So we need to be able to, to uh, find a place where families who are making $15, $16 an hour can also live. But not only can they live, but they can look around and say, Glen Ellen is a place where I want to live and where I want to stay. And I think this is a great idea. Sure, it's not the most ideal site in the world, but it's a start. And maybe the next one that we build maybe be better and maybe be, you know, a little more than that. But we need to do something. And, and we know we need to do something because we have too many seniors that have to move away. We have too many young people that want to live. Once they finish college, they can't even live in their own community. Uh, you know, it's a sad situation. So we need to do something about that. If God has blessed us, then we need to become blessings to other people. Amen. Well, my remarks will be short because it's very hard to go after Pastor Shannon. My name is Nancy Hopkins. Um, at the moment, I live at 2201 South Grace Street in Lombard. Uh, but until June of last year, I lived in um, Glen Ellen on Brayer Street for about 17 years. 
And we're one of those senior couples that moved out because rents were going up in the place where we were. And when we looked around and found that with an unused VA um, mortgage, we could actually afford to buy someplace, someplace else, we transferred to Lumber. So um, any, any efforts, whether it's in this location or another, that brings housing that is more in that mid-range would be, I think, a very um, useful thing for the community to have. And certainly we would have loved to have stayed in Glen Ellen if that were possible. So thank you. My husband won't speak because I thought we were signing up for attendance sheet. <laughs> Hello, I am Jonathan Charbonneau, a Glen Ellen resident for 30 years plus. I have autism, and I believe that the affordable housing is a good idea because it will help people with special needs. And that's very important because everybody has their special talent or ability and they should be included. There should not be any discrimination, no matter the basis. And so I'm therefore in favor of the affordable housing project. Julie Spiller, um, 15 year resident here, uh, 11 year business owner. I am Jonathan's adult, even though he's a couple years older than me. I'm his day to day helper. Um, I also have a son with autism who's 18. Um, I know many people in this room uh, personally who have children and um, young adult children who would like to stay in the community, um, potentially live on their own one day and not with parents. And I just ask um, the people south of Roosevelt to open your, your thoughts at least to the fact that this is not gonna be, potentially um, not gonna be the same situation that you found yourself in living amongst um, the problems of the hotel. I can absolutely understand your outrage. Um, I would hope that we all can understand that. Um, I hope the village really thinks this through. I've, <laughs> I've been a thorn in their side for many years. Um, I'm one who's pushed for affordable housing who's pushed not to have apex, um, or if we are gonna have those big monstrosities, to have more than two or three um, affordable residents. But um, I guess if we could just all keep this civil along this long process and know that I personally am not a north versus south. I'm just trying to do my best, so. That's all the people have signed up. Would anyone else like to make any comments? I mean, this is your chance. Otherwise, you know, as we've noted, we've done some things to give you some access to the village, um, you know, from an internet standpoint. You can always uh, email online comments to all the trustees and to myself. Um, you can come to the village board meetings anytime and make public comment if you wish. Uh, we're gonna be doing the work group, and so you'll have some more opportunities then. Um, and one of the tasks that we are going to do, and I think it was suggested by someone, we are going to try to define attainable, affordable, workforce, uh, supportive, all of that, so we can at least have that discussion with some common understandings. Uh, beyond that, any final comments? <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I uh, want to just thank you all for all of the comments and uh, the passion uh, I, I do, I mean, it, I've been here for 32 years and uh, I hadn't seen the strong South versus North uh, that much until really I got into the, you know, village trustee role. Uh, maybe that was good, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I appreciate it and we're going to work through the process and uh, get the input, but thank you.
thank you all.